Out of here. All right. Good evening, everybody. I'm Robert Breaker, and it's good to be here again. Let's uh, start with a word of prayer, okay? Heavenly Father, we just come to your prayer now. We just ask you, Lord, to open our eyes that we may behold wondrous things from your book, Lord, and learn something, God. Please edify us tonight. Please use me for your honor and your glory, Lord. Help me to say what should be said and just bring to my mind, Lord, and, and remembrance the right words. And uh, Lord, I just pray this would be a blessing that someone would learn something from this and get some comfort from it. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, so this evening we're going to look at something that uh, I've actually had a lot of people ask about. And uh, a lot of times when I do a preaching, I like to be able to use it, not just this moment that we're doing it, but also, you know, again. So that's one of the reasons why we're recording it, so other people can see it later. And a lot of emails I get are people asking about this. And a lot of times we use words in Christianity that when somebody newly gets saved, they go, what does that mean? And so from time to time, I heard Brother Mike say it, and I'll say it. I talk about the advent of Christ. And I get some emails from time to time. What's the advent? <laughs> is that Seventh-day Advent? No, no, that's not what I'm talking about. So what is an advent? Well, in the Bible, there's the first advent and the second advent of Jesus Christ. And there's actually two parts to each one of those advents. And today, in the day we live in, a lot of people, uh, they say, no, no, there's just the first advent and the second advent. It's only one part of each one. And that... When somebody says something like that, you just kind of look at a person like that and you go, have they read their Bible? Right. <laughs> because the Bible is like a mirror. And when we were in Bible school, one of our teachers said this. He said, everything that happens in the Old Testament, there's always something that's almost the same thing that happens in the New Testament. Yeah. It's almost like you're looking in a mirror and you see something back there that's over here. Why is that? Because God gave us types in the Bible of future events. It's called prophecy. So it's amazing to me to read the Old Testament because you're reading um, future history before it was even written. And now we're over here looking back and going, wow, that's like this over here. Let me give you an example. In the Old Testament, there was a prophet that God said he called from his mother's womb. And that guy never got married. He was a virgin and he was a prophet till he died. His name was Jeremiah. Was there a guy in the New Testament like that? God said he called him from his mother's womb. He was a virgin, never got married. <laughs> and he, he was somebody got, yeah, name was Paul. So you read your Bible and you find, well, there's one back there and one over here. There's a lot of things like that. I don't have time to get into them, but that's what's fun about studying the Bible is, wow, this back here is a type of this over here. And so when you get a hold of that, it, it makes you enjoy reading the Bible. I got an email the other day. This lady says, man, I just... I can't put it down. I'm just so excited about reading the Bible. Well, that's what happens when you get saved. You want to know more of God's Word, and sometimes you just can't put it down. So we're going to get started today in uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, and we're going to look at the two parts of the first advent and the two parts of the second advent. And basically what the advent is is the coming of Christ. He came once, and He's coming again. But when He came the first time, He came two different times. There's two parts of that first coming, or stages, you could call it. The two stages of the first coming of Christ. So when He comes again, He comes in two stages, or two parts. And it's divided by seven years between the two. And that's just amazing. And you learn that by reading the Bible. I wonder today if people read their Bibles. Right. Uh, just so many people, a lot of times pastors, you, you'll meet a pastor, and, you, and I get excited when I meet somebody who says they're a pastor, and I want to start talking Bible with them. And, and oftentimes they just look at me like, it's going over my head what you're saying here. And a lot of times because they're using a different Bible. Right. And that Bible doesn't say the same as my Bible, unfortunately. Right. That's why we're King James only. Amen. Right. Right. But uh, the Bible says iron sharpeneth iron. Mm -hmm. And boy, what a blessing when I get around somebody else that knows their Bible and just sit there and just, oh, we go back and forth talking about. And they're studied and I'm studied and we just, oh, it's, it's, it's refreshing to be around another brother that knows his Bible. And he shows you something that you hadn't seen, and you can show him something, right. and you just you rejoice, and your fellowship is this book. Isn't that amazing? Right. And I just enjoy that. Some of the greatest times in my life were Thursday nights. And here we are on a Thursday night. Amen. When I was in Bible school, we had a three-year Bible school. So our Bible school was a night school, and they crammed four years into three years. And you go at night from 6 to 10. So you work during the day, and you go to school at night. Well, Thursday nights, uh, we'd get off, and we'd go out to Burger King. And we were so poor, about all we could afford was the 99-cent french fries so, and the 89-cent hamburger. And I remember there were times I couldn't even afford the hamburger. So uh, I'd ask some of the other Bible school students to go there with me, and we'd sit around the table, and we'd just, we'd just eat our french fries, and we'd just talk about what the Lord showed us from the Bible that, that week. 
But what a blessing that was. I mean, I just some of the best time just sitting around. Brother, you know what I read and being encouraged. You know, God showed me this this week from the Bible. Well, those days are long gone. It's really sad that we don't have that much anymore. So thank God we're doing this on Thursday night. Amen. And we can have uh, encouragement and, and fellowship around the Bible. So 1 Corinthians chapter 15, we're starting verse 22. And I'm just going to read to verse 23. 1 Corinthians 15, 22. For as in Adam all die, and that's sad, we all die, don't we? Why do we die? Because of sin. Unfortunately, sin is the curse. For in Adam all die, even so in Christ shall all be made alive. Verse 23 says, But every man in his own order, Christ the firstfruits, afterward they that are Christ at his what? At his coming. Now he had just come. <laughs> and now Paul says, now when he comes... What is he saying there? Well, he came once, he's going to come again. Amen. So we've got the two advents or the two comings of Jesus Christ. So what I need to do is I need to draw up here. And if you will, go to Matthew chapter 1 while I'm drawing this up here. And in Matthew chapter 1, we'll read that here in a second. But I want to show you the first part and the second part of the first coming. And then the first and the second part of the second advent. And hopefully you'll be edified from this. Amen. Uh, I just want to. I want to edify you tonight and hope that it's a blessing to you. So here we have the Old Testament law, and it started with Moses. God gave the law to Moses. Now here's the cross where Jesus died. Over here we have what we call today the church age. Then we have the rapture. This right here would be the rapture. The rapture of the church. Now people say, well, that word rapture is not in the Bible. Well, you know the word trinity is not in the Bible? <laughs> Did you know that? Um, there's words that we use that aren't in the Bible. You know the word Advent isn't in the Bible? Right. But the doctrine is. Yep. So sometimes we can use a word to explain a doctrine that's in the Bible. And we do. And so that's why I'm using this word. It's a word that a lot of Christians have used. So when they do, I want you to know what they're talking about. Okay? This right here is the Battle of Armageddon. And this should be basic for a lot of people. Uh, I put this up here every week. Uh, in a lot of my preaching that I do, I love to draw this. Here's the tribulation period after the rapture. Here's the battle of Armageddon. And there's this right here is what we call the millennial kingdom when Jesus reigns for a thousand years. Now, this is the whole Bible laid out. Of course, I started at the law. There's a lot more before that going back. It'd have to be way over here starting with Adam. But here's the Bible laid out. So we're going to put up here the first coming and the second coming of Jesus Christ and the two parts. So let's do that today. Let's go to uh, Matthew chapter 1 and verse 23. When did Jesus come first? And, and by the way, let me say this. This is in no means every time that Jesus came to this earth. Right. In the Old Testament, he showed up from time to time in a pre-incarnate body Amen. as the angel of the Lord. And so there's actually more than two advents. Well, how, I guess the reason we say advents is we mean when he comes in a body in which he had a body of flesh like ours but without sin. So, but there was a different time that he showed up that he was able to, to appear in a body, okay? But this is the incarnate body of Christ, the two advents. Does that make sense to you? But he showed up in the Old Testament as the angel of the Lord. That's Jesus Christ in the Old Testament before he was born. Did you all know that? And that's interesting. You know, Joshua, remember Joshua? Joshua's out there leading the army of Israel in, and all of a sudden here comes the angel of the Lord. And he goes down, and he gets down on his knees, and he's like, hey, who was that? He was called the captain of the Lord's host. That was Jesus Christ in the Old Testament. You go over there to Acts, is it chapter 7, brother, where it talks about Jesus. And all the new versions of the Bible, they say, oh, that's so wrong, it should be Joshua. Even the Greek text says Jesus. <laughs> and what is it? It's, he's telling a story. Yeah, it is chapter 7 when Stephen is telling a story, and he said, when Jesus led the children of Israel into the promised land. And everybody says, no, that was Joshua. No, that was the angel of the Lord, Jesus, in his pre-incarnate state. Amen? Our King James Bible got it right. Amen. New versions pervert it and change it. It's so sad. So the first thing I want to say is the birth of Christ. Okay? So the first part is when Jesus came in his birth to be born. And that's about right here. So this is the first part of the first advent. He came here born of a virgin. Let's go to Matthew chapter 1 and verse 23 through 25. Who is Jesus Christ? Well, the world would have you to believe he's just some dude. <laughs> he's just some guy, some religious leader that people followed. Um, no, there's a lot more to that than just some man. Look what the Bible says. Matthew chapter 1 and verse 23. Behold, a virgin shall be with child. This goes back to Isaiah prophecy. And shall bring forth a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, 
which being interpreted is God with us. What does that mean? That means Jesus Christ is God manifest in the flesh. Yes. God himself came down to be born of a virgin and lived in this life for 33 years. So that's the first part of the first advent, him being born of a virgin. And it continues there. Let's go ahead and read it just for fun. Uh, verse 24, Then Joseph, being raised from sleep, did as the angel of the Lord had bidden him. Now, how, how, that's a weird thing, isn't it? How is the angel of the Lord? And then how God can do something we can't do. He can manifest himself several ways at, at once. So that's one of those things I can't explain. All I know is that's what the Bible says. Amen. And it continues there, and he says, and took unto him his wife, and he knew her not till she brought forth her firstborn son, and called his name, what? Jesus. Jesus. Now, do you know the word Jesus is a compound word? That right there, J, is short for Jehovah. Did you know that? Right. There's some places in our King James Bible where instead of translating Jehovah, most of the time it translated it all capital letters, Senor. Oh, that's Spanish, sorry. <laughs> Went to a different language just then. Uh, uh, it says Lord in all capital letters, L-O-R-D, in the Old Testament. And that's the Hebrew word for Jehovah. But in our King James Bible, it says Lord in all capital letters. And there's some times where it said Jehovah, Jehovah. Yeah. So our Bible translates it as the Lord Je. Or the Lord Jehovah. I can't remember the scriptures, but it just says J. Who is J? Jehovah. And Seuss, what does Seuss mean? Saves. So did you know the name Jesus Christ means Jehovah saves? Who is Jehovah? God. So God came down to save us. And it's right there in his name. That's, that's incredible, folks. That's some, but people say, well, that's not his real name. And you're just like, Ugh. People nowadays, there's so many gainsayers. They say, well, there was no J in the old, it was Jesus or something like that. Have you ever heard that? How do you know it wasn't a J? Do you know the Bible says that God revealed his name unto Israel? And then he said they forgot his name. And somewhere in there, if I'm not mistaken, it says in the last days they'll remember his name. What if it was the J sound? It said there's no J sound in Hebrew. <laughs> well, maybe they forgot it. And maybe we got it back. And maybe the J sound is correct. You ever thought about that? Anyway, it's one of those things. I just get so frustrated sometimes. People just won't believe the Bible, you know, and just want to attack anything and everything the Bible says. But go to John chapter 14. So Jesus Christ is here on this earth. And he came at his first advent, literally manifest in the flesh. He took a body like yours and mine. But he didn't get the sinful nature that we have right. from our Father. <laughs> That's a blessing. He was sinless, born with a sinless nature. And he lived 33 years on this earth before they crucified him. But while he was here on this earth, he got some disciples, some followers of his. He later called them the apostles. And look at the promise that Jesus Christ made while he was here on the earth. John chapter 14, let not your heart be troubled. <laughs> if you ever watch Sean Hannity or listen to him on the radio, he quotes that verse. Why didn't he quote the rest of it? I don't know. <laughs> he just stops right there for some reason. But it says, let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house. Now who's speaking here? Jesus Christ. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. Now look at verse 3. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there you may be also. So Jesus Christ said, I'm coming again. And this is while he was still here. So that's a future promise of the second advent. So that's the first advent, his birth, his coming down from heaven to earth. And he was born of a virgin. He lived here for 33 years. So we see when Jesus came in the first advent, and there's two stages to this. The first was his birth, okay? I showed you a couple verses, but let's look at a couple more verses uh, of his, well, let's look at his birth and his death, okay? Because he came for a purpose. What was the purpose? He came to die. Yep. And the Bible says that uh, he came as a lamb. Behold, the lamb of God, which taketh away. Whoops, I spelled lamb wrong. Sometimes my mind goes so fast, I <laughs> pass over a letter real quick. Sometimes I look back at all my videos and how many times I misspelled something. I'm just like, wow. <laughs> anyway, but the lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. So he came as a lamb. So Luke 2 and verse 11, he came to die for our sins. Because in the Old Testament, when you sin, will you sacrifice the lamb for your sins? So he knew that the reason he came was to do that, to die for our sins, because his name is Jehovah Saves. How does he save us? He dies as a lamb. He sheds his blood for our sins. 
And that's what he came to do, just like those Old Testament lambs had to be sacrificed. And the Bible says without the shedding of blood, there's no remission of sins. Right. He had to shed his blood to save us, like we looked at last week. Luke chapter 2. Boy, I'm hyped up on coffee. I shouldn't have drank that coffee. I'm just going a mile a minute, aren't I? I'll try to slow down. Am I going too fast for you? I usually don't drink coffee at night, but I tell you, sometimes it helps. So I tell you. Luke chapter 2, verse 11. Look what it says here in Luke 2, 11. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. So Jesus is the Christ, and He is the Lord. And He is God. And He's the Savior. He came to save the world. Now let's look over there at Matthew chapter 27. A lot of people are just, they, they, they hate God, they hate the Bible, they make fun of God. And they say, oh, oh, some guy he was, he died, they killed him, ha, ha, ha. It's like, you didn't read the rest of the Bible. Right. <laughs> he didn't stay down there, did he? Right. He died on purpose. He knew they were going to kill him. And then the fact that he rose again proved who he was. Who was he? God. Only God can raise from the dead. Right. So, yeah, he's not a defeated person. He's not some religious leader that everybody killed that we should all forget. Why, our calendar is based on him. Yeah. Did you know that? That's how powerful Jesus Christ is. This is 2021 A.D., Anno Domini, after the birth yeah. of Jesus Christ. Isn't that something? So, we remember Jesus not because he was just some dude. <laughs> We remember him because he's God manifested the flesh that died for our sins. Amen. And the whole world ought to remember that. But a lot of people forget it. Isn't that sad? So, Matt, what did I tell you? Go to Matthew 27. And here's what happened. He came unto his own, the Jews. And rather than accepting him as their Messiah, here's what they did. Verse 31, And after they had mocked him and took the robe from off of him and put his raiment on him and led him away to crucify him. Look at verse 35. And they crucified him and parted his garments, casting lots, as it might be fulfilled that which was spoken by the prophet. They parted my garments among them, and upon my vesture did they cast lots. You know, the whole Old Testament prophesies of all this. That shows you that he knew it was going to happen, and it was all on purpose. And it was all for a purpose, and that was to save us. Amen? Amen. Now go over to Acts chapter 4. So Jesus comes, and the Bible says he lived 33 years without sin, and then he died. And then we're told he was buried. This is called the gospel. But then we're told he rose again. Went back up there to heaven, didn't he? So he rose again. So let's read that. What does it say here? Uh, Peter, I believe, is talking to Israel after they crucified their Messiah. And look what he says in verse 10 through 12. Be it known unto you all that... And to all the people of Israel, that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, whom God raised from the dead, even by him does this man stand here before you whole. This is the stone which was set at naught of you builders, which has become the head of the corner. Neither is there salvation in any other, for there is none other name under heaven given among men, whereby ye must be saved. So Jesus Christ died, but what happened? Rose again. Rose again from the dead. So his first uh, uh, appearing or his first coming, the first advent, the first part is the birth, but then he died. So from the birth to the death. Then he died. It was three days and three nights down in the heart of the earth. Then he rose again after three days and three nights. Now, guess what's coming up? Easter Sunday. Is it this? No, it's next week. Right. right? Next week is Easter Sunday. We remember the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Right. What an interesting time for this message to remember yeah. the resurrection of Jesus Christ. So that's the gospel. The gospel is 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 4. And it's how that Christ died for our sins and was buried and rose again the third day according to the scriptures. Now watch what happened after he rose again. Go to John chapter 20 and verse 17. So he comes out of the grave, his soul, and goes back into his body. And he's in that tomb, and he walks out of that tomb, and boom, right there are these two ladies. And these two ladies show up because they wanted to come and, and put spices or incense or some sort of you know, um, thing on there to try to make it smell pretty. Because you know when you die, you don't smell too good? <laughs> uh, in our country, when a person dies, the first thing they do is put formaldehyde in them. Drain their blood out, and then that way the body keeps for, oh, months and months, maybe even a year. And you can put a, a funeral off for uh, even couple weeks. But in Honduras, I had to preach a funeral one day. In Honduras, they don't have a lot of that out in, the, out in the country. And this one old lady died. And they came and got me and said, we need you to preach a funeral. We need you to take and, and, and do it at the service too in, in the next 24 hours. And I was like, what's the rush? Well, they told me. <laughs> 
if you don't get a body in the ground within 24 hours, your body starts swelling. Mm -hmm. Your body starts, it's corrupt, all right? Our bodies are corrupt. And whatever's in there, when you die, gases start to expand. Uh, things start eating you. I mean, it, and so they literally, they called me. I was over there within hours, and she was in the coffin. And they had put in her nose and in her ears um, cotton to keep, because sometimes stuff comes out of you. I don't want to be gross, okay? I don't want to be gross, but I want you to understand what our forefathers saw and what death is. When you die... We, we have it so made in America, we don't see things like that, do we? But they had to put her in the ground without, within 24 hours. But you know, that never happened to Jesus, amen? Because he didn't have sin. Right. But that's what sin is. That's the corruption of the body. And the Bible says Jesus saw no corruption. Right. But uh, we had to do the service and put her in the ground within 24 hours so that she would not, and this is the word in Spanish, reventar. And that's a really strong word in Spanish. And it literally means just like tear apart and open up. That's what, and so I was just like, wow, that's a scary picture to think about. But that's what the human body does as it decomposes. So think about that for a minute. But Jesus didn't do that. Right. But all these Jews for thousands of years, when their loved one died, they came here to put that on because they didn't want to smell that bad. But Jesus didn't smell. <laughs> Isn't that something? So after three days, he rose again and he's standing right at the door. And he's about to walk out and up show these two ladies. And they're <laughs> and look what Jesus says. He rose from the dead. And look what the Bible says. John uh, 20 and verse 17. Jesus saith unto her, Touch me not, for I am not yet ascended to my Father. But go to my brethren and say unto them, I ascend unto my Father and your Father, and to my God and to your God. Now Jesus is God, but He's one. And there's three, but He's one. Okay, so God consists of three, but it's one God. The Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. So Jesus is standing here after he died and was risen again. He goes, I got to go back up there. So he went back up there. Now, what does the rest of the Bible teach? Did you know he came back down right after that? Mm -hmm. Now, first of all, why did he go back up there? Why did he say, don't touch me? I need to go up there. Because he just made the sacrifice for the sins of the world. Right. And he had to offer that something up there. Did you know what the Bible teaches? The Bible teaches in the book of Hebrews that in heaven there's a tabernacle. And God told Moses to build the tabernacle down here on earth as a pattern of the tabernacle in heaven. Yep. Did you know that? So up in heaven, there's an ark, just like there was an ark down here. And once a year, they would put the blood, and that forgave Israel as a nation. God took his blood and he put it up there in heaven. <laughs> then he said, okay, now I'm going to come back down for a little bit longer. And so he came back down. So that's part two of the first advent. And guess where that is? Well, let's look at some verses on that real quick. And I'll call this, for lack of whatever else to call it, uh, he came back to do a blessing. So he came to be born the first time and die for our sins. Then he went up and he offered his blood up on the mercy seat. Then he came back down and he did a little bit of blessing. Uh, another way to say it would be like this. The first time he came, he came to redeem. That was the reason he came. Then he went back up to heaven, he came back down, and then he came back down here, and he came down to command and tell his disciples what to do and to direct them and say, here's what I want you to do. And the Bible says he was here for, guess what, 40 days. Now, there's three days here that he that was in the grave, and what I'm about to show you is he showed up seven days later. And then he was here for 40 days. So 7 plus 3 is 10 plus 40, that's 50. So what happens? That means that Pentecost is when he went back up again. Does that make sense to you? So here we go. Let's look at some verses real quick. Let's go to John chapter 20, where we just were, and look at verse 19. John 20, verse 19, and we'll read down to verse 22. Then the same day at evening, being the first day of the week, when the doors were shut, when the disciples were assembled for fear of the Jews, came Jesus and stood in the midst and saith unto them, Peace be unto you. So here he is showing up to them after he rose from the dead. So he must have gone up and then came back right back right. down. And so that's the second part of the first advent. And it continues there. And, and what did he say? Well, I don't think I have time to read it all. But look at what he says here in verse 21. Then said Jesus to them again, Peace be unto you, as my Father has sent me, even so I send you. So he said, I'm going to command you to go out and do something. I'm directing you right now. Here's what you go do. And then in verse 22, And when he had said this, he breathed on them and saith unto them, Receive ye the Holy Ghost. So he's like blessed them right there with the Holy Spirit. That's kind of interesting. So we have the birth is the first part or the first stage of the first advent. Then he died, went back up, and came right back down and stayed for 40 days. 
it says over there in Acts. And I think I have here, yeah, Acts. Go, go to Acts chapter 1. So Acts chapter 1, Jesus takes them all out to this, this hill or this mountain. And he says, all right. Look what he says there in verse 3. In whom also you showed himself alive after his passion by many infallible proofs, being seen of them forty days, and speaking of the things pertaining to the kingdom of God. So after forty days, now he says, okay, I've got to go back up and stay up for a little while. All right? Twice he, he came the first time. You all with me? But he says, now I'm going to be gone for a little bit longer this time. A lot longer, actually. And then I'm going to come back. And so what happened? We'll look at verse 9 through 11. And when he had spoken these things, while they beheld, he was taken up, and a cloud received him out of their sight. An old preacher said, that's the taxi cloud to heaven. <laughs> I don't know. And he says, the cloud uh, took him out of their sight. And while they looked steadfastly toward heaven as he went up, behold, two men stood by them in white apparel, which also said, Ye men of Galilee, why stand ye gazing up into heaven? This same Jesus, which is taken up from you into heaven, shall so come again in like manner. So... He was born, that's the first stage, died three days, three nights in the heart of the earth, rose again, and then he said, now I've got to go up there, and he went up to heaven. Now, he could have just stayed there if he wanted to, but that's not what the New Testament tells us. He came back down, stayed for 40 days. Then he said, okay, and they all saw him. They all saw him. They all saw the resurrected Christ, and they were like, watching him go up. And the last thing he said is, by the way, I'm coming back again. Whew, what a blessing, amen? So we have a resurrected Christ, but we also have a promise of his return. And that's a blessing. So he is coming back. Well, it's been almost 2,000 years. That's a long time to wait. <laughs> but the Bible says the day with the Lord is 1,000 years. 1,000 years. To God, it's just like he's been gone two days. You know, it's just like not too long for him, but it's, whew, it's too long for us, isn't it? So now we got to look at this. We got to look at the second advent. Now there are two stages of the second advent, just as there are two stages of the first advent. All right, do you all understand the first advent? Okay, I mean, it's pretty easy if you just read your Bible to see that, that he literally came twice to this earth. Now, if that's the case, remember the Bible's like a mirror, then when he comes the second time, he's coming back twice. But you know, there's a lot of people out there that claim to be Christians. Some of them missionaries, some of them pastors. And they say, nope, nope, there's no rapture. Nope, he's just going to show up. And when he comes back, that's it, Armageddon. And you go, well, the first time it was two times. Why isn't it two times? No, no, and they won't listen to anything you say. <laughs> so for those people, I hope they're watching. Tonight you're going to see there's two parts to the second. And I'm going to show you what those two parts are. So we see the two stages are the two parts of the first advent. Now we're going to look at the two stages or the two parts of the second advent. Let me put them over here. And uh, so hopefully you know that's the first one. Here's the second one. Okay. Where to begin? Where to begin? Let's go to um, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. Now this is what we call the rapture. And I believe in the rapture. I believe in Jesus Christ coming back right here at the rapture. Now, today, a lot of people say they're Christians and they say, I don't believe in a rapture. Well, I don't know what's wrong with them because Jesus said he's coming back. Yeah. And he says when he comes back, he's going to take you up to a mansion that he has for you. When would that be except at the rapture? Because when he comes down at Armageddon, he stays. Yeah. <laughs> but at the rapture, he comes to get what's his and take them back up. So there's got to be two parts. It doesn't make sense unless there's the two. Does that make sense to you? So when you go to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, you clearly see the Apostle Paul talking. And Paul is speaking of a pre-trib rapture. <laughs> because he uses the word we and us. Or does he say us? Well, we for sure. Let's say, say we. He uses the term we. He's saying we're waiting for Jesus to come back. And then we, when he comes back, will go up with him. Look at what he says, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 13. But I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep. Asleep means their body died. And so their body is asleep in the grave. But if you're saved, your soul's in heaven when you die. And it says that ye sorrow not, even as others which have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so them also which sleep in Jesus will God bring with them. So he's going to bring their souls back from heaven and then he's going to resurrect. You see, a lot of people say, don't use the word rapture, use the word resurrection. Well, I don't mind using rapture, but yeah, the rapture is a resurrection, isn't it? Because those that are dead in Christ, their bodies are resurrected. So either way, I think it's okay to use either term. And then it says, um, 
will God bring with them. So that's the soul coming back down to reunite with their body. For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain. Now Paul wrote this almost 2,000 years ago. He says, now we that are alive, what is he saying? He thought in his day there was going to be the rapture. He's literally saying, now when the rapture comes in my day, he didn't realize at that time that it was way out here. So he believed in a pre-trib rapture, didn't he? He thought, I'm going to go at the rapture when it comes. He didn't say, well, I believe the rapture is way at the end. <laughs> it sounds like he's thinking rapture first before that other thing. And so he continues there. Now, I won't read all of that. You can read that. But um, it's very good. Read 15, 16, 17 when you get a chance because that's what it talks about is going to happen. Uh, voice of the archangel, the trump of God, all these things. But look at verse 18. Look at verse 18. Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. The rapture is a comfort. Yes, sir. But you've got people all over YouTube. Oh, I tell you, I get emails, I get comments in my video. All these people, there's no rapture. That's all they leave, just a comment. There is no rapture. Oh, so we're supposed to believe it because you say so? <laughs> no, I finally figured it out. They want to start an argument. They want somebody to say, yes, there is. No, there's not. No, there. I'm not getting in their little game of arguing because that's all they want. Usually I just go, delete. <laughs> that way there's no argument because there is a rapture. I just read you the passage. It says, look at there at verse 17. To meet the Lord in the air and so shall we ever be with the Lord. So what is this called? That's called a gathering together unto him. And that's over in 1 Corinthians chapter 15 again. And if you get a chance, that's a companion passage of the rapture, 1 Corinthians 15 and uh, verse, um, what is it, 15, uh, 49 all the way down to 55. And uh, what is it saying there? Well, verse 51, Behold, I show you all a mystery. We shall not all sleep. We all shall be changed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye at the last trump. For the trumpet shall sound and the dead in Christ shall be raised incorruptible. And it continues there. Like I said, I don't have time to read all this, but this is the rapture. Amen. Now somewhere there was a verse. Oh, I haven't got there yet. The gathering together. We're gathered together with Christ. Okay. I'm going to show you one, two, three, four, five more verses that are pre-tribulation passages. All right. If you're taking notes, write this down. Because nowadays, I mean, people are just coming out of the woodworks claiming to be Christians. And they're screaming, there's no rapture. There's no rapture. The rapture doctrines meet up. <laughs> it's like, really? Who made it up? Darby in the 1800s. Well, then how come Paul taught it? <laughs> well, nobody else taught it. Well, how come 100 years, 200, 300 years after Jesus, the early church fathers are saying, now, when the rapture comes before the tribulation, <laughs> Ephraim of Syria, like 300 years after Jesus, those are his exact words. Now, when the rapture comes, well, doesn't use the rapture, he, he uses the gathering together. When the gathering together comes before the tribulation, exact words of a guy 300 years after Jesus. But people will lie to you. And they're doing it all over the internet. There's no such thing as a rapture. No one ever preached a pre-trib rapture. And I'm just going, yeah, according to you, but not according to the Bible. And it's just so frustrating, these people. And I finally figured it out. They want to go through the tribulation because they want to fight. And they want to say, I'm going to defeat the Antichrist. And they're so full of pride, they think they're going to have victory over the Antichrist. You know what the Bible says? After the rapture, God will send them a strong delusion. Yeah. They believe a lie that they all might be damned. <laughs> I would be scared to teach that false doctrine of no rapture. Wouldn't you? That's right. Whew, because if you miss the rapture, you're going to be deceived. Uh, a lot of people think they're, they're disclosing all this UFO alien stuff right now. Because when the rapture comes, they'll just say, oh, that was just aliens. Well, all these people that don't believe in a rapture, they'll say, see, we're good. <laughs> you're not good. You're going to accept the Antichrist. And guess what you're going to do? You're going to think it's Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. Because your doctrine is so messed up, you ignore this right here. And you think this is the last coming. There's not two parts. There's only one. So when the Antichrist comes down, you'll say, well, that's Jesus. He's here for a thousand years. And you will willingly accept the Antichrist instead of Jesus. You know, how? that's that's horrible. Right. That's deceiving people to take away the rapture doctrine. Mm -hmm. That just bothers me. So I think when the rapture comes, they'll try to explain it away and say, well, aliens took them. Mm -hmm. And then the people say there's no rapture, says, see? So what are we waiting for? Jesus. Here comes the Antichrist. Oh, I am Jesus. Okay. And they'll accept the, oh, it's so sad. It's so sad. So we got some verses to get to. I won't read Titus 2.13, but it says, looking for the blessed hope and the glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. Our hope is the rapture. Yes. That's what the rapture is called. It's called our blessed hope. Do you realize how bad this world is? We have no hope if we don't have the rapture. Because the only hope is to go through the tribulation and die as a martyr for Jesus with your head cut off. Is that a hope? 
comfort one another with these words. Hey, I got to comfort y'all. Uh, the Antichrist is coming. He's going to kill you. Is that, is that comfort? Any hope there? Without the rapture, I got no hope, folks. So it must be there's a rapture because the Bible says so. Uh, 1 Corinthians 1.7. 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 7. Um, over and over and over, I read through Paul. I see a pre-trib rapture. I see a hope. I see a comfort. I see Jesus coming for his bride. Uh, 1 Corinthians 1, 7. I see him preserving us blameless. Look what it says. 1 Corinthians 1, 7 and 8. In 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 7 and 8 says this. So that ye come behind in no gift, waiting for the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, who shall also confirm you unto the end, that you may be blameless in the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. All right? How am I preserved blameless if I have to go through the tribulation? The Bible says in the tribulation period is when they give the mark of the beast. If you take the mark of the beast, the Bible says when he comes at Armageddon, anybody that has the mark of the beast is pitched into hell. Right. So that means if there's no rapture, that I could lose my salvation if I rejected Jesus and I took the mark. Is that possible? No, because Paul teaches eternal security. Once saved, always saved. And he says, when you're saved, Ephesians 1.13, he says, you're sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. Amen. Well, you're not sealed if you take the mark and you lose it. You weren't sealed. So there must be a dispensation. <laughs> and that's what I believe. I believe in dispensations. But yet all over the internet, there are no such thing as dispensations. Uh, well, then we're in trouble, folks. We have no comfort. We have no hope. We, we have to just not take the mark because why? We take the mark, we lose it. <laughs> How do you lose something you never had to begin with? Mm -hmm. The Bible says when you're saved, you have passed from death unto life. Yep. I was with somebody was sending me comments the other day and they're saying, oh, breaker, you're just you don't know what you're talking about. Eternal life is what you get after you die. <laughs> I go, do you read your Bible? Jesus Christ says, and I give unto them eternal life. Right. And then it says, hath passed from death unto life. I have eternal life now. I'm not waiting to get it. Right. When I got saved, I got it. And that means life for all eternity. Uh, 1 Thessalonians 2.19. So I'm just going to give you some verses that are pre-trib rapture verses here. And a lot of people have asked about this. And I'm just throwing out there everything I can as uh, ammunition, I guess, for Christians that have to debate with these people every day. Because every day you come across people who say they're Christians and they say, no, 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 there's no rapture. That's the new teaching in most churches. There's no rapture. All right, well, I'm giving you the verses so that if you run across somebody like this, you can say, hey, do you read your Bible? Can I show you some verses and share with you? And you know what you'll do? You'll find out if that person's really a Christian or not. Because a real Christian will say, yeah, please, show me. Someone who's not a real Christian will say, no, I don't want to hear what you have to say. It's like, get away from me, you know. Then you, you don't really care about the Bible, do you? You know? So 1 Thessalonians 2 19, and it says here in 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 19 and uh, 20. For what is our hope, our joy, our crown of rejoicing? Are not even ye in the presence of our Lord Jesus Christ that is coming? For ye are our glory and joy. Boy, what a blessing it'll be to go up at the rapture and see other Christians. But when I go up, I'm going to be looking all around, see who's going with me. And boy, I tell you, that's going to be the great divider of who was saved and who wasn't. A lot of people who thought they were saved, when it happens, they're going to go, uh, what, what just happened? Uh, you weren't reading your Bible. You weren't really saved. You said something with your mouth. You, might, you didn't believe from the heart. There was something wrong there. And, uh, you know, that's going to be a scary time for some people. Right. Been in church their whole life, thought they were good. And then they're left behind. That's sad. But it'll be good for us that are saved. We'll be so happy. And uh, what a blessing that'll be. That'll be joy. Yep. So joy, a comfort. And I'm looking forward to that comfort. It's my hope. Now, 1 Thessalonians 5, 23. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, and verse 23. And the very God of peace sanctify you wholly, and I pray God your whole spirit, soul, and body be preserved blameless unto the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Well, that's the rapture. So what's going to be preserved blameless? Well, I will be blameless when I go up to the rapture. I'm not going to the tribulation to where I might reject Jesus and take the mark and might go to hell. See how that's not even, how is that even possible? But there are people there today that say, no, there's no rapture. Yeah, if you're a Christian, you better buckle up and be ready <laughs> because you better be ready to get your head cut off. It's like, I don't, I don't get you. So salvation, a lot of these people, they're trusting in their works and they want to brag on their works. And so they want to be left behind so they can brag on, look what I did for Jesus. I fought for Jesus. And it's like, 
how do you know you won't be one of those that believes the lie and be damned? I'd be scared to death to be left behind. I'm so thankful I got the right gospel through the blood of Christ. And I'm so thankful that I'm going at the rapture. How about you? Uh, look at 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. This is where we see the term the gathering together. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. Verse 1 through 3. For yourselves, brethren, know our entrance unto you, that it was not in vain. But even after that we had suffered before and were shamefully entreated, as you know, at Philippi, we were bold in our God to speak unto you the gospel of God with much contention. And boy, it's the same today. You preach the gospel of faith without works, and boy, there's contention. A lot of people in so-called Christianity, why they think, it's my works. No, it's only the work of Christ. Your works are the works of a sinner. And God can't accept a sinner. Did you realize everything you do was done by a sinner? <laughs> and God, you think God goes, yay, good job, sinner. No, God looks at you and goes, man, you're still a sinner. But if you come over here to what I did, I'll take your sin away. And then I'll be pleased with you. You think he's pleased with what a sinner does? I don't think so. But look at verse 3. Verse 3. 2, 3. For our exhortation was not of deceit, nor of uncleanliness, nor of guile. Now, well, I wanted a verse. I'm in 1 Thessalonians, aren't I? Well, amen. Good preaching. Let's go to 2nd. Amen. <laughs> you should have said something. So let's go to 2nd Thessalonians, chapter 2, verse 1 through 3. Mm -hmm. Now we beseech you, brethren, by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and by our gathering together unto him. Well, that's at the rapture. We're gathered together unto him. That ye be not soon shaken in mind or be troubled, neither by spirit nor by word nor by letter as from us, as that the day of Christ is at hand. And let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come, except there be a falling away first, and the man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition. So, notice it calls the Antichrist two different things. The man of sin, the son of perdition. Yeah. Why does it give the Antichrist two names? Well, because the Bible tells us in the book of Revelation that the tribulation is seven years. And boy, I'm going to have to erase that because i got to write here. But the Bible tells us that the tribulation is a seven year period. And it's divided into three and a half and three and a half. And the first three and a half is a literal man who is the Antichrist, who's the man of sin. But in the middle, he is killed. Yep. Did you read that in Revelation? I believe it's chapter 13, where he receives a mortal wound. And all the world wonders after the beast. They're like, wow, he died. And then he comes back to life. What's he doing? He's trying to imitate Jesus. Jesus died and rose again. The devil's like, well, I can do that too. <laughs> but how does he do it? Well, my thought is the guy dies and his soul goes to hell, but the devil comes in and somehow controls his body. And now he's no longer him. It's just his body, which is literally possessed by Satan. Right. And so Satan somehow figures out how to take a man's dead body and, and live in it and bring it back to life somehow. I don't know how. Maybe it's a, a clone. I don't know. But and he's called the son of perdition. Why? We have the son of perdition way back here in John. And that's what's called Judas. Judas is called the son of perdition. And what's the Bible say? And the devil entered into him. So the Antichrist is going to literally have Satan incarnate inside of him. And he's going to die in the middle of the tribulation. And the Bible tells us, and he continues. Only the King James Bible says continues. And he continues 42 months. You know what 42 months is? Three and a half years. Right. So if he's continuing, then he must have been doing something before that. I don't believe in a mid-trib rapture. I believe in a pre-trib rapture. Right. So we read that here, and it says, don't let anybody deceive you. Today they're trying to deceive you. Say, no pre-trib rapture. Well, anybody that says there's no pre-trib rapture, I'm like, oh, I know you. You're Second Thessalonians too. You're the deceiver. <laughs> I'm not going to listen to you. My hope is this right here. Only hope I have is Jesus come and take me out of this world. Now, who am I? Well, when I got saved, I became a son of God, right. but I also am in the body of Christ, which is the church. Yep. The Bible tells me in 2 Corinthians 11, 2, you can turn there and read it if you want, that I'm a spouse to Christ, that the body is a spouse to Christ, and it says, as a chaste virgin. So the body of Christ, which go to Ephesians 5 if you want to and read, the marriage is like the type of Christ in the church. Matter of fact, when we go up to the rapture, we go to the marriage supper of the Lamb. That's when we get married. So, according to the Bible, Jesus is coming back for his bride. And he says she's a virgin. Now, I don't know if you're married. Maybe you are. But what kind of man says to his fiance, You know, I really love you. Really want to marry you. But is it, okay, is it okay if I pass you off to this guy for a little while first? And when he's done with you, can we get married? That would be disgusting, wouldn't it? Right. That woman would be like, You don't love me. <laughs> 
Well, that's what a lot of people in the church teach. No, Jesus isn't coming in a pre-trib rapture. He's going to let us go through the tribulation and then he's going to maybe marry us. <laughs> Would we be a virgin still? How, how could we be a chaste virgin if we... That doesn't even make sense. That sounds disgusting to me. That just bothers me. If he loves us, he's going to get us out before that guy comes and is able to mess us up. You know, and I just look at that and I just look at the Bible and these people that, that preach against a pre-trib rapture. I just go, man, there's something wrong with these people. Right. They're deceived because that's what the Bible teaches is the rapture is our blessed hope. Yes. And you are trying to take away my blessed hope if you get rid of the rapture. So the rapture is what I call this. And this is Jesus coming at the rapture. And it's our rescue. <laughs> our rescue. I got an email from this lady. And uh, she was really struggling with this. She's watching all these videos on YouTube and she's watching me and she said, Brother Breaker, I don't know if it's a pre-trib or mid-trib or a post-trib rapture. I'm still studying this out. I said, well, here's my videos on it. Here's the scriptures you look up. But you come to your own conclusion and you study for yourself. And so she studied all my videos. She watched all these other people that are against the pre-trib. And she said, man, I was just so confused, but I'm praying and I'm studying and I'm reading. And I waited and I waited a week, a couple weeks. And finally she wrote back. She says, well, I'm a pre-trib rapture believer. I said, well, tell me why. She says, well, I'm reading Matthew and it says, as it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be in the days of the coming. And she said, I was just reading Noah. I went back and said, where's Noah in Genesis? And she said, God told Noah to build the ark to save him from the wrath to come. <laughs> what happens in the tribulation? The wrath of God is poured on. So we're saved from the wrath. So she said, I believe in a pre-trib rapture, God takes us out before the wrath comes. Right. I said, well, that's pretty good. What was that? That's a type. So she saw that type and she said, I just, I see that type. And there's lots of types like that. There was another time when God saved Israel in the Passover and led them out. And they were saved from um, the plagues and all that other stuff of Egypt. And all. So there's all sorts of types in the Bible. But I see a pre-trib rapture. The more I read the Bible, the more I can't deny it. It's a pre-trib rapture. So in this time... After the rapture, then we go up and there's the marriage supper of the Lamb, but the marriage supper of the Lamb is after the uh, judgment seat of Christ. And that's when we get rewards for what we did for Jesus. And then the Bible says we come back with Jesus and he comes back as a lion. And he comes back at the battle of Armageddon. You see, first the marriage, then the battle. Yep. Do you remember in the Old Testament when a guy uh, got married? And it's something, I can't remember the rules or something, but if he got married, well, he couldn't go to battle for a whole year. Right. He got to spend a whole year at least with his wife before he went to battle. Marriage before the battle. <laughs> I mean, just all through the Bible, you can't help but see types of the second advent of Christ. He comes first in the clouds, then he comes back and literally sets his foot on the, on the earth to destroy his enemy. So I see that and I just go, wow, that's amazing. So I see the rapture as the rescue when Jesus comes to marry his bride, take us out to safety, because God always tried to protect his people. Amen. And then I see he comes again over here and he comes here to destroy his enemies. So he comes here is when he comes to reign. He actually comes to conquer and destroy his enemies. Because God's going to let the devil take over the world during this tribulation. Right. The entire world is going to have to obey that man and take a mark in their right hand or their forehead and literally be slaves. His cattle, basically. You, you mark cattle, don't you, with a brand. He's going to brand people. Yeah. And that Antichrist, he's going to own the world and he's going to own people's soul. Well, can't own mine, so I'm, I'm, all my faith is escaping before it. Amen? That's my hope. But Jesus, when he comes back at Armageddon, he says, now that's enough of that. <laughs> and he comes back to conquer and to destroy, and he comes back to reign and to rule. And he is going to rule on this earth for a thousand years. Amen. And where am I going to be? Well, I read my Bible and it says I'm going to be on a white horse coming back with him at the Battle of Armageddon. Because when he comes, it says he comes with his armies. Well, that's us who are saved. Amen. So I'm looking at all this and I'm like, man, this is awesome. So he came the first time as the Messiah for Israel and they rejected him. But he comes back and then Israel accepts him as their master, as the king. See, the first time he came, he came as the Christ. But they said, we don't want the Christ. Well, then they finally figure it out. 
Do you realize that the tribulation is called the time of Jacob's trouble? Right. Are we Jacob? Jacob is Israel. So that's just another reason why we don't need to be here. That's why I see the rapture first. And then God goes back to dealing with Israel, who killed their Messiah. And during that time, if you read your Bible, you understand, man, they're going to figure it out. Yep. Jesus said, you, you don't accept me, but you'll accept one that comes in his own name. Mm. Yeah. And then he says, but you're going to accept the false one. Right. But then later we see they accept the true one. So they accept the Antichrist before they accept the true Christ. Mm. And then the Bible says, well, they go into the wilderness and they're protected for 1,260 days. That's three and a half years. So something happens in the tribulation. They accept the Antichrist at first, and then they realize that's the wrong horse. We just backed the wrong horse. And then they flee because he tries to kill them all. And they're protected by God, and they finally realize it is Jesus. And so he comes back, and he saves them, and he rules over them for a thousand years in their natural bodies, the Jews that make it through. But we are in our glorified bodies that are saved when we go at the rapture. So we get to rule and reign with Christ for a thousand years right here. Now that's just what the Bible says. Amen? But notice how there's two parts to that second coming. Just like there was two parts to the first coming, right here and then over here, the two parts of the coming of Christ, there's two parts. Rapture and then Armageddon. Right. So let's just look at a couple more verses on that, on Armageddon. Let's go to Revelation chapter 16 and verse 16. And this thrills my soul. I am so glad. Do you know what Paul says? He says, we are more than conquerors Amen. through Christ. The devil might think he's winning. He's trying to put down Christians. He's trying to close churches. He's trying to... You know how many people that are Christians have been murdered by communists over the last hundred years? Over a hundred million people dead under communism. Just murderous communism. And what if our nation becoming communist? Yep, right. What was it? Stalin said the goal of socialism is communism. So if you become a socialist nation, you're going to become a communist yep. nation. And what is their goal? Put in concentration camps every Christian. Well, guess what? I'm leaving. So I'll just make it easy for you. Bye-bye. You can have it. But those that are left behind and realize, oh, no, maybe some of them will have enough guts to, to lay down their life and let their heads be cut off for Jesus. I don't know how hard that'll be because there's going to be some lies that, that are going to try to deceive people. But uh, the Bible says that Jesus is going to come back and he's going to destroy all those that are on the side of the Antichrist. Right. Revelation 16, 16, and he gathered them together into a place called in the Hebrew tongue Armageddon. Armageddon. This is what we call the battle of Armageddon when Jesus comes at the end of the tribulation period and all of the enemies of the Antichrist are there. And I don't remember, is it 200 million man army the Bible talks about? Can you imagine 200 million men in one place? Armageddon. Armageddon. The hill of Megiddo is what it literally means. And you go to Megiddo, there's this huge valley. And old, uh, what was his name? Napoleon went there back in the, it's either late 1700s, early 1800s. He stood up on the hill and he looks down and he goes, this would be a perfect place for a battle. <laughs> he was a battle guy that probably, he was like, best valley in the world for a battle. It's like, hey, stupid, did you read your Bible? The Bible says that's where the final battle is going to take place. Right. He should have known that if you read his Bible. But that's the battle of Armageddon when Jesus comes and destroys. And look what it says here in Revelation 19.11 through 21. 19.11, And I saw heaven open, and behold, a white horse. And he that sat upon him was called faithful and true, and in righteousness he doth judge and make war. His eyes were as a flame of fire, talking about my Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And on his head were many crowns, and he had a name written that no man knew but he himself. And he was clothed, and he was clothed with a vesture dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God, capital W. And the armies which were in heaven followed upon him in white horses, clothed in fine linen, white and clean. Now who's that? That'd have to be us. Yep. If there's no rapture, how the heck do we get up there? You know what I'm saying? It doesn't make sense to take the rapture out and say there's no rapture. Right. It makes no sense whatsoever. It just doesn't, it doesn't work. Two parts of the first advent, first coming, two parts of the second advent. Yep. And so continue there. It says, The armies which were in heaven followed him upon white horses and clothed in fine linen, white and clean. And out of his mouth goeth a sharp sword, that with it he should smite the nations. And he shall rule them with a rod of iron, and he treadeth the winepress in fierceness and wrath of Almighty God. And he hath on his vesture and on his thigh a name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. And it continues there and it says, Hey, birds, come over here and eat all the flesh of the captains and everything else. And he destroys the Antichrist. And look at verse 19. And his army. 
That's us who are saved that went at the rapture. And then the beast and the false prophet uh, were taken and cast alive into a lake of fire burning with brimstone. Verse 20. So this is all about the battle of Armageddon. Right. When Jesus destroys, guess who? The United Nations. <laughs> the Antichrist is going to be the head of the UN. And the UN is, is, is anti-Jewish now. Yeah. Just imagine in the tribulation. Right. The Bible teaches that the Antichrist hates the Jews. And that's what he does. He cannot wait to go into... Jerusalem and sit down on the throne and say he is God. We were told that in, is it 2 Thessalonians or 1st? I forget. But Paul says when the Antichrist says, I am God. Where is it? Jerusalem. That's what everything in this world is all about. People get in power and they all want to go over there for some reason. Why do you want to go to some little mud hole in the desert? What's so great about that little place over there? Well, the Bible. <laughs> it all goes back to the Bible. If you don't believe the Bible, then why on earth is everybody interested in Jerusalem? It doesn't make sense unless it's the devil wants that place because that's where God's name was put. Right. And that's where God's people were. And the Bible says he tries to kill them and exterminate them and marches in there. And he, he gets a lot of them, but they get to flee and they're protected by God for 1,260 days in the wilderness. So all this is prophesied in the Bible and we're seeing it all come to pass. The United Nations, many of the nations in the United Nations are Arab nations that hate the Jews. Do you know that? Mm -hmm. Right. And when the Antichrist takes over, he's going to hate the Jew. He's going to want to go in there and he's want to get rid of those Jews. Look at uh, Revelation 14, 20 real quick. I forgot to read this part. So when Jesus comes back at Armageddon and he destroys all the Antichrist's army, look what the Bible says happens. Mm -hmm. Revelation 14, 20. It's kind of gross if you think about it, but Revelation chapter 14 and verse 20 says, And the winepress was trodden without the city, and blood came out of the winepress, even unto the horses' bridles, by the space of a thousand and six hundred furlongs. A thousand six hundred furlongs is about 160 to 190 miles. Two hundred million men army. And when God destroys all them, and us on our white horses, we get to destroy them too. I don't know, maybe we'll have a sword. Imagine 160 miles that way and 160 miles that way, and the blood's to a horse's bridle. How high is a horse's bridle? Yeah. About right there. A swimming pool of blood almost 200 miles long. <laughs> That's going to be the biggest, bloodiest battle the world's ever seen. And who's going to win? Jesus Christ. Look at what it says in Zechariah 3.8. And I, boy, I'm, I tell you, I'm not a bloody man. I don't want to fight. I don't like fighting. I don't like killing. I don't like battles. I don't, but you know what? <laughs> it says in righteousness he makes war. And he will be right because the Antichrist is the man of sin. And he will be doing the right thing. So Zechariah 3.8. The Bible tells us that the United Nations will not endure. God is going to take the United Nations out and say no more UN. The most corrupt organization that's ever existed on the face of the earth. Look into the United Nations sometimes and all the scandals and everything else. But in Zechariah, I believe it's Zechariah 3.8. Is that the right one? Nope, it's not. What am I looking for here? I want the verse that talks about he, the nations. Maybe it's Zephaniah 3.8. It is. It's Zephaniah 3.8. My bad. Let's go to Zephaniah 3.8. Sounds so close, don't they? Zephaniah. Zephaniah is just before Zechariah. Haggai and then Zephaniah. Zephaniah 3.8 is God's plan for the United Nations in the New World Order. This is the end of the Illuminati and the deep state, according to the Bible. Because the whole goal of the United Nations and the deep state and the New World Order is we hate those Jews, we want that land. And what's kind of funny is nowadays we're so close to it we can see why. You know they, they found one of the greatest oil reserves in the world under Jerusalem, yeah. under Israel. <laughs> money, the love of money is the real. And they're looking at that like, well we'd like to have that place and have that money. You know, the Bible says hurt not the oil or the wine. <laughs> A lot of people think olive oil but... We call that black stuff oil today too, don't we? It's hurt not the oil. It's interesting. But that's what they want. Money makes the world go round. People want that money. Look what it says in Zephaniah 3.8. Therefore wait ye upon me, saith the Lord, until the day that I raise up to the prey, P-R-E-Y. For my determination is to gather the nations, that I may assemble the kingdoms. Isn't that funny? The United Nations, when they come together, they call it the UN Assembly. They just follow the King James Bible, don't they? And they're going to follow it straight to a battle in which they lose. How about that? That I may assemble the kingdoms to pour out mine indignation, even all my fierce anger for all the earth shall be devoured with the fire of my jealousy. We just read that. Out of his mouth goeth the 
flame, a sword like a flame of fire. And that's the end. And Jesus is going to set up a millennial kingdom. And let's go to Revelation chapter 20 and I'll be done. And Jesus Christ is going to rule and reign as the king. See, he came as the king of the Jews the first time. But they rejected him. They could have had that then. <laughs> we wouldn't have had all the problems we've all gone through today. But, it, you know, they rejected him. But God is so long-suffering, He gave them a second chance. Amen. What a great God, amen? Always is a God of second chances. But Revelation chapter 20 tells us that Jesus Christ is going to rule and reign for a thousand years. And I believe verse 1 and 2 would be sufficient. Revelation chapter 20, verse 1, And I saw an angel come down from heaven, having the key of the bottomless pit and a great chain in his hand. And he laid hold on the dragon, that old serpent, which is the devil and Satan, and bound him a thousand years. And it continues there. Look at it says in verse 3, a thousand years. Look at verse 4, a thousand years. Look at verse 5, a thousand years. Look at verse 6, a thousand years. Look at verse 7, a thousand. So the millennial kingdom is how long? He told you six times. It's a thousand years. Yep. But I've met pastors. You've met pastors. I've met missionaries. We don't believe in a millennial reign of Christ. Well, that's figurative. <laughs> but the Bible just said it's a... The whole Old Testament is all about the Messiah that comes to rule and reign. So you're saying he's not going to, you're going to try and take away his reign? You took, tried to take away my hope, now you're trying to take away his reign? Watch out for these apostates right. that claim to be Christians that don't believe the Bible literally. I believe in a literal rapture, and I believe in a literal tribulation, and I believe in a literal Armageddon, and a literal thousand year I believe the Bible. I believe the Bible. So that's what the Bible teaches. So that's the two parts of the first and second advents. The first time Jesus came, it was two times he came down from heaven. Came down from heaven to be born of a virgin. Lived 33 years and died. And then he went down to the earth for three days, three nights. Mm -hmm. Then he came up and he said, don't touch me yet. I'm not done. I got to go do something up in heaven real quick, but I'll come right back. And he did. He came back for 40 days and then he went back up. So two times, two parts of the first advent. Mm -hmm. But today they say, well, it's not the same in the New Testament. Well, that, why wouldn't it be? You read your Bible, you say, well, that's, that's a, a prophecy of that over here. So the second time he comes, he comes in two parts. He comes in the clouds at the rapture, like a thief in the night, takes with him his bride, which is interesting. They're, they're finding out all these old uh, texts in Jerusalem, all these old texts, and they're finding out Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judah. And they're finding that in Bethlehem, the wedding ceremony was this. The father said, uh, only I decide when my son gets married. And so the, the guy wants to marry this girl, and this is the custom in Bethlehem. He would go in front of the gate in front of everybody, and he'd bring with him a cup of wine, grape juice, and he'd offer it to her. If she took it, she's saying, okay, I'll marry you. If she rejected it, she said, no. Wine is a type of blood. <laughs> You're saved through the blood, you know. Do you accept it or do you reject it? If she accepted it, then everybody said, all right, they're going to be married, and everybody looked at the father of the man. And it was understood that now the man who wants to get married is going to go build his house. Mm -hmm. And then he, Jesus said, I prepare a mansion for you. <laughs> Building a house. So he's talking to them like the customs of the time. And said, now, I'm going to come get you. But I can't come get you until my daddy tells me. Mm -hmm. And so the daddy got to be like, <laughs> you know, how mean is the daddy? How long am I going to make you wait type of thing, you know? If you do good, I'll say go get. But the daddy had the right at any time to say, okay. He could say it at 2 in the morning. He could say it at 12 noon. And that, that boy, he built the house. He got the house all done. He's like, Daddy, Daddy. Dad goes, hold on, hold on. Days go by. Weeks go by. Daddy? Daddy's like, I don't know. And usually, I don't know usually, but I, I would say if I was a dad, this is what I'd do. I'd be like, 4 in the morning. Wake up, son. It's time. Go. Ah! You know, you wake up. And you're, okay, I'm going. And you run to the house to get her. And she's supposed to be ready and waiting for you. Yeah. And so that's the, the, how they did it back then. That's what Jesus was saying, is that's the way I'm going to do it over here. Yeah. And you're telling me, no, there's no rapture. I don't believe you. I think you've got problems if you don't believe in the rapture. Right. Because I see it in the Bible. I see it in, in the customs of the day. I, I see it, the only way it works is with the rapture to take us up, to give us our rewards, to come back down in, in horses and army with Jesus. <laughs> Amen? And we're his bride. So I just want to follow the Bible and I believe it. And I believe in the rapture. Amen. Now, the only question is, are we going to be alive before the rapture? <laughs> I mean, they're right now doing stuff trying to get rid of people, aren't they? 
There's almost uh, 9 billion people in the world. You know what the Bible says? In the tribulation, two-thirds of them are going to be killed. Yep. That's 6 billion people dying off in the next couple of years. You say, when is the rapture? I don't know. But I'll tell you what, we're about to celebrate the 73rd year of Israel. Mm -hmm. That's pretty amazing. It says in the book of Psalms it, that a generation is between 70 and 80 years. If the tribulation is seven years, it can't go past 80. So 2028 would be 80. So subtract seven, that's 2021. <laughs> well, wouldn't it be nice if this was the year? I mean, it kind of would work out, wouldn't it? Hello, are you listening? I mean, it would work out pretty perfect, you know? And then uh, we get out of here. But this is the next event on God's calendar to get his bride. Now, a lot of people, they, they twist the scriptures. They don't rightly divide. The Old right. Testament, God said to Israel, you're my bride. But that was God the Father. Yep. It was like God the Father married Israel. And he said, you rebellious woman, you ran off on me. So if the Father has his bride, then shouldn't the Son have his bride? Right. So I see the church as the bride of Christ. Mm -hmm. And I see the Old Testament Israel as the bride of the Father. And the Father didn't forget his bride. He said, I'm going to come back to you. Yep. So here, Father comes back. And he's going to... It just all fits, folks. And so Jesus is coming soon. Amen. And I just wanted to share this. A lot of people on the internet have asked, what's an advent? And, and can you prove a pre-trib rapture and things like, well, there you go. We use terms like this. For many years, we've talked about an advent. And so the advent is the times that Jesus comes. But the two main comings of Jesus Christ is two parts to each one. Mm -hmm. And so there it is. I did the best I could. I hope that's a blessing to you. Amen. Any questions or any input or anything? Sometimes I enjoy questions, something I didn't think about. Anybody have anything else? Well, I, I try. Amen. I know I went pretty fast. If you're watching on YouTube, there's a way you can actually slow this down half speed if I'm going too fast, you know. <laughs> I'm used to speaking in Spanish, and you're just like, I'm going to in Spanish a lot faster. So, all right. Well, let's go to Lord in prayer. Lord, thank you for the Bible. Thank you for this book. Thank you for the truth. Uh, Lord, thank you for right division and rightly dividing, and thank you for dispensations, and thank you for understanding that we can see what the Bible says, and we can understand future history. Lord, we, we're excited because we know what's about to happen, and we just pray, Lord, that you'd let it happen, and that it be soon, and until it does, please help us to get people saved. Lord, if there's somebody here or somebody watching that's not saved, Lord, help them, please, to come to you and trust your blood for salvation. And uh, Lord, if they are saved, please help them to share this with someone else and uh, get other people to know what the Bible says. Lord, anybody that claims to be a Christian that's departed from the true teachings of the Bible, help them to see the error of their ways and to get back to the pre-tribulation rapture teaching, Lord, and get right, Lord, because, boy, what a shame it would be to have your doctrine wrong when Jesus does come at the rapture. So thank you, Lord, for the truth. We love you and we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, I'm done. Stick a fork in me. Amen. Thank you and God bless.